Good afternoon, everyone joining us today. My name is James Petrangaro, and joining me are attorneys Emily Tolick and Adam Dauschus uh, with the law firm. We're very excited and, and pleased to be speaking with you uh, about what is a, an important piece of legislation that came through um, in, in the past few months. And it's certainly well intended. And uh, in practice, it's going to help protect the students to whom all of you and, and us as well have committed our careers to. Um, but at the same time, we know that these employment history review obligations that Faith's Law uh, is bringing to us um, are, are new, and they're going to bring much work uh, to our HR offices and, and our school administrators, um, and, and challenges as well, at least um, probably in the, in the initial year until everybody really gets a feel for all of this. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, I, I know we have NCAA tournaments uh, starting today, and, and folks may have divided attentions, and that's fine. We welcome that. Um, but we also hope to impart um, some help and some, um, some advice on these new obligations. Um, we've received some questions already. For those of you that would like to ask questions, feel free to use the Q&A function in the webinar, um, and we're going to try and address as many of those questions as we can at the end of our presentation. And hopefully along the way, we address a lot, a lot of the questions as well. Um, so Emily, why don't you kick us off here and, and get us started? All right. So um, as you all know, there's kind of two iterations of faith law now. So by way of background a little bit, um, the first face law was passed and it was effective um, in December of 2021 with some floating provisions kind of coming into effect later in July of 2022. And those provisions really required schools to develop an employee code of professional conduct policy to prevent um, sexual misconduct with students. I know a lot of you have been, um, have been or have already implemented those plans um, and so um, or those policies. And so you're, you're kind of running with those, but the law is really intended to um, prevent, you know, sexual or romantic relationships with students, inappropriate relationships with students, and um, addressing that conduct. And then what we're really going to be focusing on today is the trailer bill to Bates Law. So that is effective on July 1st of this year, of 2023. Um, so I know we've gotten a, a couple of questions about, you know, when to kind of start these processes. And as we're going to talk about a little bit later today, none of this is required until July 1st of 2023, right? Um, so just keep that in mind as you're coming up with, um, you know, your plans. And the main components of the trailer bill are the employment history review, and there's also a requirement to notify parents um, when there's an allegation of sexual misconduct. Today, we're gonna to be focusing solely on that employment history review piece, um, but we do know that there's other pieces, and certainly if you have other questions about the other portions of Faith's Law, um, you know, we're happy to, to assist with those you know, outside of this webinar as well. Just, just one point, Emily, if I may about yep. the 7 one start date, that even if you're hiring now for next school year, these provisions aren't in effect yet. So just keep that in mind that the effective date is really 7 one and then going forward. So we've had some questions on that. So I just wanna be clear up front with that. Yeah, no, I think that's great clarification, Adam. So, you know, for example, if you're, if you're um, even if your employees are going to start next school year after July 1st, if they're being approved at your March meeting, at your April meeting, they've already been hired. We don't have to go through this yet. It's for those being hired past this point and for subsequent school years. So when we talk about the employment history review, um, it, it created a new section of the, the law created a new section of the school code and the citations up there on your screen. Um, but really what it requires is that schools and contractors conduct an employment history review for applicants for employment that are going to have direct contact um, with children or students. This employment history review, if you're um, a public school district or a charter school district, this is in addition to that required fingerprint-based criminal background check process. So this is in addition to, and you know, um, a little bit different from that process. So uh, the law provides that prior to hiring any applicant who's going to have this direct contact with children or students, the school or contractor is responsible for 
confirming it has no knowledge of information that would disqualify the applicant from employment. Um, the law does not define what would disqualify an applicant from employment. So um, it's a little bit up to um, interpretation. Um, it, the, the school or contractor must also require applicants to swear or affirm that they are not disqualified from employment. Um, and then re, uh, applicants are required to complete a template form that ISBE has developed that includes a bunch of background information about them, right? So, you know, a list of their current employers, a list of former employers that were schools or school contractors or where the applicant had direct contact with children or students, um, an authorization that that um, applicant um, is allowing you as a school to, you know, reach out to former employers and for those employers to release information to you. Um, and then a written statement from the applicant about whether they've ever been subject to a sexual misconduct allegation or asked to resign or disciplined for or, or were terminated as the result of a sexual misconduct allegation or ever had their license suspended or revoked as a result of those types of allegations. That information has to be disclosed unless the allegations were determined to be unfounded. So that's a lot, right? Um, I think something to keep in mind as we're going through all of this is ISBE has already created these forms. Um, they're up on the ISBE website. And so you don't have to create anything on your end for them to fill out. The forms are available. Um, it's just kind of checking boxes in terms of the timeline and the process. Emily, can I jump in there real quick on, on those ISBE templates? Yeah. Uh, so the, the school code, this trailer bill uh, for faith's law requires required ISBE to create those templates to be used. We've already gotten some questions from clients as to whether they should be using ISBE's templates, whether they should be creating their own templates, whether we have any um, recommended revisions to the templates. Um, and, and I have some thoughts on that. Like, first of all, ISPE's form <laughs> says that it can be revised by by each district. Um, we, I have found the forms to be adequate. I think ISPE did a, a, a more than a sufficient job in creating the forms. They really just parrot what the law uh, yeah. expressly requires. And I think there's a practical reason to use those forms. If each district or, or dozens and dozens of districts are creating their own templates, um, you're going to hear in a little bit about how there's this process where when we're hiring, we have to make the request to a former employer, a former school district, most likely, um, for the form to be filled out. And so I'm sure all of us would like to see the same forms being sent at this, you know, in, in every instance. So there's not a need to learn some new form that a, that a school district created. You, by all means, can put that on your letterhead if you want. But there is just a practical advantage to, to everyone using those same forms. And for those of you who haven't seen them yet, um, Emily mentioned that they're on ISPE's website. It's under the educator quality page. And the first drop down mem uh, menu is Faith's Law Employment History Review. So um, if you didn't get the email that was sent out from the state board, go ahead and do a, a quick search of their website and you'll find it on that page. Thanks, awesome. Emily. Thank you, James. Um, so just in terms of overview of the law, and then we're going to dig into more, you know, what these requirements are and what some of the definitions are that, that you should know as you're moving forward. Um, this does apply to all permanent and temporary positions. It also applies to substitute employees. Um, but do note that you don't have to repeat this process for a substitute um, for each assignment that they're posted to. Um, it, it, you only have to repeat it if they've been removed from your sub list and are you know, applying again or coming back to your district again or your school. Um, and then contractors are also required to conduct the same employment history review and inform the school of any instances involving their employees that would disqualify them from employment. Um, this is different than, you know, we talk about those criminal history background checks. This is different, right? So for our criminal history, our fingerprint-based criminal history background checks, um, you know, you as a school district are required to, you know, do those checks yourselves. Um, so typically we have something in, in the contract that states that they're going to, you know, their employees are going to be made available to us. Here, a contractor can and should be doing these checks for their own employees um, and then checking in with you about who is being assigned to your school.
Um, so gonna... oh, yeah, I was just going to mention one thing about the substitute um, employees, because obviously most of our clients have had trouble finding subs over the last couple of years. So to Emily's point about having to do this for substitute employees, if that employee is on another district's roster, the law is clear that it does not relieve us from doing the same check, right? So even if you know we have a feeder district where we know this person subs, that will not relieve us at the high school level from doing the same check. So I think people should be aware of that as well. That's a great point. And, and I would also point out while we're on that subject that the law, when it, when it refers to employees, it does not distinguish between full-time and part-time employees. So if you have a part-time employee who is a classroom assistant or even a teacher or other position that's maybe a 0.3, we still have to go through this process if they have direct contact with students. Correct. And on that point, I'm going to turn it over to James to kind of drill down on some of those, you know, smaller pieces within the, the overview of the law. And, and I'm going to pass it off to Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Total, 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 totally fine. So with respect to direct contact, we've already seen questions come in with respect to who does this apply to, right? And the law gives us a definition of what direct contact is. And that's on your screen, right? It's the possibility of care, supervision, guidance, or control of children or students, or routine interaction with children or students. So what does this mean practically, right? The question I've received is, does it apply to volunteers, right? Our, our parent, the, the room parents who may come in once a month to distribute goods as it may be. And no, the law is not going to apply to them, right? Is it going to apply to referees who we hire to referee a basketball game and they're, they're not supervising or controlling students in any manner? It's not going to apply to them. So before just blindly applying um, these new faith law requirements, we really have to look at what the employee or contractor may actually be doing for us or volunteer. Um, so that's, that's a really important point um, off the bat. I know we've got questions about it, but just something to keep in mind um, as we move forward. You want to go to the next slide? All right. So, hey, Adam, let me, let me yeah. jump in there because there's, yeah. there's a question already about to what schools does this entire process that we're talking about today apply? Does it apply to public schools, to private schools? Um, do, do either of you want to address that? Yeah, well, it, it, the, law, the law sets forth a clear definition, right? And it means a public or non-public elementary or secondary school. So it's not just our public schools, but our non-public schools as well. This law is going to apply to them. And we also interpret that as, you know, applying to our charter schools as well. Yep. All right. So let, let's get into the, the meat of the law, right? And particularly the applicant requirements. So what, what do they need to do? And the two forms that Emily and James have been referring to that are on ISPE's website, the, these forms are going to be used, one is going to be used entirely by the applicant, right? There's not going to be a spot for a school district or a, a non-public school to do anything. It's going to be entirely on the applicant to certify that they haven't been the subject of, you know, an allegation, a sustained allegation of sexual misconduct or asked to resign or not had their license renewed because of an allegation of sexual misconduct. misconduct. So that's one form, right? And, and, and that's where where it says the written statement regarding history of sexual misconduct allegations, okay? That's all on the applicant that they need to fill out and certify. There's another form, right, that they need to fill out part of it, okay? But they're, importantly, they're going to need to fill out this form, the second form that I'm referring to. And if, if you're looking at the ISP website or if you're looking at the ISP form, the form is entitled Authorization for Release of Sexual Misconduct Related Information and Current Former Employer Response Template. This is the form that we are going to have some work to do on. All right. Now, let's be clear. The applicant has to fill out or provide us with a form for each current employer or former employer 
that fits within three categories, okay? One is the, the employer or former employer was a public or non-public elementary or secondary school, right? Or their employer had a contract with such a school to provide services, or the employer engaged in or, or permitted the employee to engage in, or they had the possibility to engage in the care or supervision of children, right? So if you work for a park district, or if you worked for, you know, any daycare where you had that ability, right? Those are going to fall in the, into one of these buckets that you're going to have to list, right? But you're not going to have to list, or the employee is, applicant isn't going to have to list, employers who don't fall into one of these buckets, right? So if you work at Dick Sporting Goods, you're not going to fall in to having to fill out this form and for us to have to follow up with that person. So let's be clear as to who this applies to in terms of the employers, all right? So what's going to happen is they're going to give you this form and it's going to be filled out in terms of their name and the current or former employer to which we the hiring district are then going to send and ask them to give us information about this applicant. All right. So we're going to take this form, the second form that I've been talking about, read the title of, and the, the employee or the applicant is going to authorize us via this form to reach out to the qualifying employer or past employer to seek information. All right. And there's going to be, again, essentially those same three um, acknowledgements that the employee has to give us on the first form I referenced on this form, right? That the applicant hasn't been the subject of an allegation of sexual misconduct. They haven't been discharged or been asked to resign because of an allegation of sexual misconduct. And their licensure hasn't been held up because of an allegation of sexual misconduct. That former employer is going to have to then send the form back to us, right? Now, importantly, a question that we've seen already is, you know, what happens when we send this off and we don't receive a response within that 20-day period, right? And I know James is going to get into this, but it's the last bullet on this slide here. And that we can't hire that applicant until we've initiated this process right? So that's a really key point, that it's not that we've got everything back in our hands. It's that we've initiated this process, that we've taken this form that the applicant's given us and then sent it off to the past employers, all right? That's a really important point to, to, to keep in mind here, because we've had a lot of, lot of questions about, well, what if they don't get it back to us in time? And now we'll get into that later, but for purposes of the law, it's us initiating this process. That's our obligation. All and, right. And I, Adam, I think it bears, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that the initiation of the process that we're talking about there is not just having received the form from the applicant. Yep. Right. That should be part of our automatic onboarding process yep. that they're giving us this form when they apply for a job. Right. Yes. Or, or maybe we, we delayed until we've notified them that they've made the second round of the interview or, or whatever the sure. process is. But sometime before we've made the offer to them that we're going to then bring to the board for, for ultimate approval, they have to have given us this form. Yep. And before we bring the hiring recommendation to the board, we also have to have initiated that request to the other or the prior employer, the prior school yep. or the daycare center. Uh, or, or the, the park district where somebody may have been a counselor in, in supervising children, right? That all has to have happened or been initiated before we bring it to the board for approval. Yes. And so it's that initiating the process that is somewhat similar to the criminal background check. We can currently, through, the, through that criminal background check process, as long as they've been fingerprinted and we've requested the results for our public school uh, administrators that are out there on the call, Right. And we, we can hire them pending the results of that background check. Yes. It's similar here as long as we've made that request to the former employer. 
That's right. And, and the law is very clear on that point that we can go back, right, and use the information that we get subsequent to the hire or subsequent to the conditional hire. Go back and take action, right? If they're untruthful or something shows up in those documents that would suggest or lead us to believe that sexual misconduct took place at their prior place of employment. So that's a really good point, James. And, and let me chime in on, on the word or the phrase you just used there too, sexual misconduct. Uh, the, the statute defines what sexual misconduct is. Like, what are we talking about when we're asking the applicant and the former employer <laughs> to certify whether the individual has been the subject of an investigation concerning allegations of sexual misconduct and what were the results of that investigation? So the stat, it, it bears repeating if we've already said it, but I, I want to go through them. Sexual misconduct is defined as including but not limited to. So keep that not limited to language uh, in mind. It's sexual or romantic invitations from the employee to a student. It's dating or soliciting a date, engaging in sexualized or romantic dialogue, making sexually suggestive comments towards a student, disclosing or actually exposing themselves of a sexual or romantic or erotic nature. So that can actually be physical exposure or can be talking about inappropriate sexual encounters or sexual situations or a sexual indecent romantic or erotic contact with a student. So it's, it's a very broad definition. And when you take all those together, that's essentially what we define grooming as, whether there's actual physical contact or not. That's the kind of misconduct that is at issue in, in all of this. Yep. All right, Emily, okay, great. So the first bullet on this slide, right, talks about our requirements in terms of contacting that applicant's current and former employers that are listed on the form we've been referencing, right? That's, the, that's one of our primary obligations here is to go back and have them certify that no sexual misconduct for all intents and purposes took place, okay? There's, there's an obligation on that employer, that prior employer, right, to provide the information within 20 days after receiving a request for it, right? So we've had some questions about when does the 20 days kick in? Because we, the hiring districts, we're going to get these, right, for our former employees. So what's our obligation? And it's 20 days, that 20 days starts running when we receive the request for information, all right? And it's 20 calendar days. So once you get that, you should provide it within 20 days. Now, we, we, James and I were having a discussion earlier about this, that yes, it's, it's 20 days, right? That, that if you send this form off to another district, a, a past employer, and that clock's running, right? And after maybe two weeks, you know, 14, 15 days, our suggestion is follow up with that person, right? Don't let that time period just run by and say, well, never got it. James, Adam, and Emily just said, all you had to do is initiate it. We're good. Maybe, right? But is, is that the best practice? And it, I would affirmatively reach out if we haven't heard within a reasonable amount of time, hey, what's going on? We just want to touch base here. We sent this over to you. Do you need another copy? We'd like to get it back. Just so, just so that we could show, right, that we have some proof that if we never get that form, right, we never get the, the form back within 20 days, within 50 days ever, right, we could show potent, potentially a judge or a jury, look, we did our due diligence. We didn't just send it off. We took a neck, another step to try to get the form back. They never gave it to us. So you know what? We did go, go ahead and hire that person. So it's just a kind of a best practice tip that I would recommend. I don't know, James, or I mean, if you have anything to add on that point. Well, no, I, I absolutely agree. And if the 20 days has passed, I would, I would follow up again. And then if we still aren't yeah. receiving a response, I would document that in the file so that we've made clear that we've done everything we reasonably can to reach out to that former employer to get the information. Yeah. Um, the statute doesn't provide a remedy where the former employer doesn't provide uh, the records or the information. Um, I think ultimately it could lead to liability for that employer if, if they're willfully refusing Holding to answer yeah. you know, the, the request. I also wanna to touch upon when does that 20 days start to run? 
Um, the statute says that this, the 20 days begins to run when the former employer receives the request. And I think there's a practical um, element to that, that we should be sending these requests via email, um, especially when we're talking about making the requests to other schools where we're obtaining the email um, of either the human resources office or the administration in general is typically, a, a, you know, not a difficult task. Sending it via email gives us a time stamped piece of transmission where we can show, okay, we sent it to school district ABC on Thursday, July 2nd, That's the clock started running then, as opposed to in the mail, uh, where we have to, you know, perhaps talk about a delay or the mailbox rule as to when it was actually received. So I, I love email in this situation. And on that point about the 20 days, sending this form to the past employer, it should be going to their director of HR or their central office, right? We're not sending it to the school, right, itself. So let's send it to the person who's going to be able to follow up with this right away. And that's going to be the director of HR, assistant superintendent of HR, you know, central office should be receiving this form from us. All right. The, the third bullet here is we also have a, an obligation that once we get these forms from the prior employer, right, and if they're school districts, we need to be checking based on ISPE's Ellis system to verify that the information that's been provided to us by the applicant is correct. So there's another layer to this, right? That once we have the form and once we see who those prior school districts were, we have to go into Ellis and verify that that's true, all right? That's another statutory requirement that we have. The last statutory requirement that I, that I wanna reference before I hand this off to James is that at the time of separation, right? At the time, going forward after July 1, 2023, once we have an employee leave us, for whatever reason, right, that it should, the form, the, the form that we've been referencing, where it talks about filling out yes or no, there was an allegation of sexual misconduct or the person was fired because of sexual misconduct, we need to be filling that out affirmatively. So before we even get a request from, that, from the, the former employee's new employer, new district, before that even happens, right? We should have this form done on our end and in their personnel file, because we all know, right, that there may be turnover in central office, people's memories fade, and as opposed to having to go back and search personnel files to figure out what happened, this form should be affirmatively done when that person separates employment for us, because as soon as we get the request, we can whip it out, right, that we have that knowledge base already done and it was filled out at the time the person left, all right? And that comes from the statute too. Not only is that best practice, but that comes from the law itself. So keep that in mind as well um, when, you, when people are separating from employment for whatever reason, all right? Adam, so, let, me, let me address yeah. a couple of things on that point. So uh, we've gotten some questions uh, about that ISPE template and why does it distinguish between answering no, the individual's not been the subject of an sure. investigation or answering no, the, the investigation was not founded versus I don't have records or information to reach that conclusion. And, sure. and I believe that ISPE put that information in there and it's in the statute for the situation where you're you know, an HR director, this request has come to you and it's asking you about an employee that's been gone from the district from, for 20 years. Right. No one has that institutional knowledge anymore about the employee. And the only way we can answer that in good faith is to go back to the personnel file and do some digging to see what were the circumstances of this employee leaving. And if there's no records in the personnel file or any other file that we might have accessible to us, about whether any of the departure was related to an allegation of sexual misconduct, that's when you're going to check that box that says, I don't have access to information or I don't have records that suggest any of this is true. And, and that's, that's the distinguish between answering no and answering essentially, I don't know or I don't have the records. And I, it's a really important point, James, because our, our clients are going to start receiving these requests, right? <laughs> shortly after July 1, 2023, where they're, at, where they're going to be asked about employees, former employees, who may have worked for us 10 or 15 years ago, right? 
and doing some digging in the personnel file, it may not reveal anything, right? It may one way or the other. So that's why that box is there. And I agree with you why the law specifies that we don't have any reason to believe that sexual misconduct was the basis for their separation, but we also don't have records of it. So something to keep in mind because we're going to be asked to fill that out as well shortly. I also think it's important to note on that point that say an employee, you know, is the subject of a, a sexual misconduct allegation, right? And the employee leaves pending investigation, the investigation was never completed. That is a situation where you will be answering yes, um, because there was a sexual misconduct allegation, right? It wasn't unfounded. Let's say we didn't finish the investigation. It wasn't unfounded. So it is true. And I, we have, or it may be true. Or it is that we have information. Sure. There you go. About a sexual misconduct allegation, right? So this is also a plea to, you know, conclude your investigations, but yeah. um, even if an employee leaves, but just keep that in mind as you're, um, if you're one of the people who's going to be answering these forms. And, and when we Great talk point. about what's the reason and the policy behind this law, Emily just hit it on the head there. The, the law is written this way so that employees that are subjects of the of sexual misconduct allegations can no longer you know just resign from employment and go into hiding for a few months or a year and then go apply to another school district right the old kick the can down the road kind of approach um, where the allegations have come in and instead of finishing the investigation uh, this the employee resigns and then the school takes the position okay it's not really our problem anymore. The employee, we can't finish our investigation. The employer's, the employee's gone. We no longer have, you know, authority over that individual to compel them to appear for an interview and an investigation. And therefore there's just no findings. And, and under the old way of doing business, there were employees that thought that they could escape, you know, that scrutiny by, by acting that way. Now, if there's allegations and an investigation open and the employee resigns and disappears, you are, as Emily mentioned, you are going to have to check yes on that template. Yes, there were allegations and we did not find that the allegations were unfounded or unsubstantiated. So Emily, on the issue of records, why don't you take us yep. to the next piece? <laughs> so I want to quickly touch on records. Um, so before we kind of get to some of the more practical implications and, and turn to some questions, um, I think on this records piece here, the most important points for me are these points one and three. So the first one is these are not going to be public records. So any information received under, you know, that we've been talking about today, any of these forms, are not going to be deemed a public record. And that's important for your FOIA officers to really understand, right? So if we're getting a FOIA request, for example, for um, you know, a personnel record of so-and-so employee, these specific records are not considered public records that need to be disclosed pursuant to something like FOIA. Um, you know, secondly, our second point here states that, you know, schools are contractors that receive information under base law, under this employment history review process, may use that information. They're not required to, but they may use that information um, for, for the purpose of evaluating, you know, an applicant's fitness to be hired for continued employment. Um, and they may also report that information to ISBE, to a state licensing agency, uh, to a law enforcement agency, to DCFS, to other schools or contractors, to prospective employers. So it really gives you, you know, two, two important points here. It really gives you, A, the ability to consider this information when making employment determinations, and that's important when we're looking at this in concert with um, laws like the Illinois Human Rights Act that, you know, prohibit discrimination based on arrest records and things like that, right? Um, and it also gives you the ability to share this information with other schools with, you know, for example, if there's a, uh, maybe you catch uh, an allegation of sexual misconduct that hasn't been resolved that you think needs to, you know, go to DCFS as a mandated reporter or, or elsewhere. This does give you the ability to do that. And then 
you know, another important point is that schools, employers, school administrators, contractors, anyone who provides information or records about a current employee or about a former employee or applicant under this provision of faith's law is immune from criminal and civil liability for the disclosure of those records unless, you know, the records that are provided are knowingly false. Um, so as long as you're doing your due diligence and you're providing information that you have a reasonable belief is true, um, you are immune from liability for any of your conduct, both civilly or criminally. Um, this immunity is in addition to um, any additional privileges or, um, you know, any other privileges by law that you may have with respect to the disclosure of, you know, an applicant's um, materials. Anything else on records before we move on? All right, let's get into some of the practical implications here. And this time I'm going to turn it over to James. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're talking about having to request information from prior employers and, you know, the results essentially of a sexual misconduct investigation. Um, and from time to time, we may run into a situation where previously, years ago, the employer and the employee, you know, when there may have been an investigation, might have just handled the situation by entering a separation agreement where the employee says, I'm going to resign and the employer is going to let me resign. And, you know, historically, there may have been an old or prior practice where the employer also says, and in exchange for the resignation, we promise not to disclose any information about the investigation. That's not an approach that we like to practice. I think that approach is, is wrought with pitfalls. <laughs> um, and under FOIA, most of that information would be, able, would be discoverable in, in any event. But the law makes clear that moving forward, Absolutely, if an employee is under investigation for sexual misconduct and they resign or there's some sort of separation agreement, that agreement cannot suppress the disclosure of any of this information to the, to the subsequent employee. Nor can a collective bargaining agreement have a provision in it going forward that says upon an employee's termination or separation, the school is not going to disclose any information related to the sexual misconduct investigation or the findings or outcome of that. That is absolutely prohibited. And if we try to negotiate those terms, they are gonna be void as a matter of law. So uh, the law makes that very, very clear. Um, Emily, can we go to the next slide? Okay, we, we talked earlier, M Emily mentioned that the statute does not define what does it mean to disqualify an, an employee from employment? So after we've received the first form from the candidate, after we've sent it off to the former employers to give us information and paperwork related to any investigations of sexual misconduct, after we've cross-referenced the list of employers that the candidate has given to us with the, the ISPE Ellis uh, directory to make sure that all of the former employers were disclosed, or intentionally omitted, we as the hiring entity now need to make a, de a determination as to whether any information learned in that process disqualifies the individual from employment. So what kind of situations would we see qualifying under that standard that is undefined? I think if you look at the intent of the law, the structure of the law, if you receive information from a prior employer, noting that there was an investigation and they weren't able to determine that it, the allegations were unfounded or unsubstantiated. It's now up to our discretion to decide was that misconduct that was at issue in that investigation something that is not tolerable. And when I, when I went through the definition of what sexual misconduct means, there's quite a range, right? It, it ranges everything from what might be minor boundary invasions, right? Perhaps an employee that is just a little too close to kids engages in hugs or pats on backs just too often and it makes students feel uncomfortable. There is a big gray area there as to whether that's sexual in nature or is that just somebody that's, you know, more of a, a touchy-feely kind of person, right? 
And what one district determines is sexual in nature versus what another district determines is all going to depend on the facts. So there's going to have to be some exercise of discretion there. I think if we see a situation where when that employee gives you the list of, say, six former employers, and then you go to the ISPE Ellis website to cross-reference that, and you see that there was an employer that was omitted, we now have to determine, as it says on the screen there, was that a harmless omission? Like, did the employee just forget or overlook the fact that they worked for somebody? Or does that raise a red flag for us? Is it more on the intentional side? We're going to have to look at the facts and circumstances of that. Was that an employer that the, that the teacher or the employee worked for seven years where it would be really difficult to argue, oh, I just forgot about that? Or was it an employer, you know, very early in the individual's career that might have been 25 years ago where the employee was there for, you know, six months or a cup of coffee and then separated under circumstances that have nothing to do with sexual misconduct, right? We're going to have to look into all of that. And I think the information we get from those former employers is going to shed light on the, that situation. Um, I would also point out that even though this diligence process, and that's really what this is all about, right? It's forced diligence for us to discover is if there's any red flags of sexual misconduct in this employee's past. The omission of an employer on an application is something that should be raising flags in our HR departments at all times when we're onboarding someone, whether it's related to sexual misconduct or not. Maybe that person was fired from their job or separated from their last employment, not because of sexual misconduct, but because they got into a physical altercation with another employee or said something really, really inappropriate, not of a sexual nature, but of some other nature that resulted in that employee being separated, right? The omission itself might give rise to a red flag and you should be looking into that as well, unrelated to kind of faith flaw reasons. Um, Number three there on the screen, waiver of disclosure versus NDA, and NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. The law has this really interesting conflict in it um, that I think the, the ISPE templates settle, and, and that's another reason why I like using them. The law says, on the one hand, employers only have to turn over information that they are not legally prohibited from turning over, perhaps in another state. We know in Illinois, all schools have to have to turn over this information when they're requested of it, or information that's not prohibited from disclosure by an agreement or a severance, you know, an employment agreement, a severance agreement, a separation agreement. Well, the whole point of the law is to prohibit those kinds of agreements. And the form that the individual, the, the applicant has to fill out on the front end requires them to release their former employers of any obligation to hold that information back. I mean, it, it actually says, I acknowledge and I'm authorizing my former employer to release all information that's requested in here. So even if there's an old agreement that prohibits disclosure, filling out that form, executing that part of the form by the applicant should release the former employer of any obligation to hold that information back. So that information should be free flowing. Um, what about the situation, number four here, and we touched about this before, where a prior employer is non-responsive. We've addressed that. We, we've suggested be diligent about it. Follow up once, twice, and do your follow-ups via email so you can create a, a record. If you call, create a record internally, just a quick memo that, that you followed up and received no response from the individual, Okay. What about the situation though, where the employee lists a former employer and the former employer is no longer in business? Maybe it's a, a child care center, a daycare center that's not, not around anymore. Um, what can we do there? I, you know, th there's only so much we can do. If there's not a business to contact, um, if the information isn't publicly available about who they worked for, there's nothing we can do in that situation. If they provide us with, you know, the owner's personal information, sure, we can follow up with the owner of that daycare center to find to find out if they can disclose this information. But if they're no longer in business, you know, arguably they're no longer an employer that is obligated to answer these um, these questions. Um, same thing if the individual discloses an employer but says I don't have any contact information for them and that information is just not publicly available out there. 
there's only, you know, at that point, there's nothing we can do to request that information from them. Um, contractors, everything we've talked about today has been on the side of the school's obligations, but most schools have some form of contractors that come in and perform work. Whether we're talking about food service individuals, maybe it's custodial staff, it could be teachers or, or aides that we're using a staffing agency because due to the shortage of employees out there, we just can't fill these spots on our own. All of these requirements that are required of schools are also required of contractors that place their employees in our buildings with one exception. Because contractors don't have the special access to Ellis that schools have, they're not gonna be able to do that cross reference. But contractors do when they receive the disclosures of this information from their applicants that are seeking to be employed by the contractor. They have to go through all of this process as well. I have concerns that some of our contractors have no idea that this new law is out there. And so the question becomes, should we address this in our agreements with the contractors, in our food service agreements, in our custodial agreements, in our agreements with um, you know, anyone that we're bringing in to do services that we don't directly employ? I think there's three approaches. There's the approach that the law already requires them to do this, and it doesn't require us to follow up or do anything with the contractor. That is an, that is a, an approach that can be taken here. I'm not sure in the spirit of the law that's the best approach. A very aggressive approach would be to require the contractor upon completing the process to disclose all information and copies of all records to our schools. That is going to be the safest approach when it comes to protecting students, but it's also the approach that's going to give you all of the information that we can no longer hide from. And I'm not suggesting we should be hiding from it, but it does put the school on notice as to whether there may be an issue with a contractor's employee. And so if we're gonna ask for that information, we shouldn't just be collecting the information and then not doing anything with it. We need to be reviewing it and making sure that the contractor made an appropriate determination as to whether that employee should have been disqualified from employment. There's a middle ground approach. And that is to say, in our contracts, we require the contractors to certify that they are compliant with this new provision of the law. And that upon request, the contractor is gonna provide us all of this information and the records. And we just make that part of the contract agreement, the language. That way, if any information comes to our attention, whether it's a, an anonymous tip or a complaint from somebody, we can go back, ask for that information. And in most of our agreements, we like to advise that we have the ability to direct the contractor to remove an individual from our buildings. And so there's value in having some language in our contractor agreements on this new law, particularly to bring attention to the issue so that all of our contractors are, are following this new law. Absolutely. I, James, I, I fully endorse the third approach that you just referenced there about making them certify, putting the onus on the contractor to comply. If we need to follow up, we'll follow up. But this is on you guys, not us. Um, Adam and Emily, anything you guys want to add? We have some great questions that have come in uh, yeah. through the chat and, and, and otherwise uh, well, that we can start jumping into. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I saw a couple of questions. Uh, I, I saw several uh, asked about, does this apply to Ill employers outside of Illinois, right? Or should we be sending this to employers, past employers outside of Illinois? The answer is yes. There's no qualification in the law that says this is just Illinois schools. So yes. To, to that question. And I think just to go back to, there was a, a couple of questions I saw up there about when do these forms kick in? And I thought, James, you had a really good point. I don't know if you said it before or after these questions about this really needs to be part of the, the application process, right? And that we're providing these forms prior to taking the recommendation to the Board of Education and that we're initiating on our end, sending out the, the one form that pertains to us to past employers before we recommend that person for hire. And we can always go back. And if we have to terminate the employee or dig further based on what we receive, that's fine. But the initiation process does need to start before 
any board of education action. I don't know if you want to, you know, but I just want to be clear on that front. Yeah, I mean, I, I have two approaches on that. One, I think we could say we should do this process uh, at, at the same point at which we require the criminal fingerprint background check, yep. right? And, and so it makes sense to say this is similar to that, and yep. that's the point in our onboarding process <laughs> that we're going to do this. I, I have another kind of more practical suggestion, and that's if you're not making a last minute hire and you're onboarding, you're interviewing in April or May, um, and this recommendation for hire is not going to be brought to the board maybe until June or July, and you have time to do all of this, why wouldn't we do it well in advance of actually bringing it to the board? So that we can avoid the situation where the board approves a hire, and then we get information back from the prior employer, which raises flags, and we're saying, uh-oh, this isn't an employee we would have recommended for hire had we known this. And all of a sudden, now we're having to go back before the board, potentially, to request termination of an employee. Yep. And if we, and I want to make that clear, that if we do, de do determine upon receiving this information that the employee should be terminated, that is expressly part of the authorization in the law, that there should be discipline of the employee up into termination. Yep. And so I think from just an administrative standpoint, being prudent on the front end, and, and if we have the time to do it well in advance of the recommendation to the board, that's, that's the best approach. So that we don't have to then at a, another meeting or a special board meeting that has to be called, go back and ask for the termination of that employee by the board. Yep. Emily, any questions you see you want to think are uh, relevant? We have lots of great questions. I'm trying to type some answers as we're going to, because I know we're going to be short on time. Yeah. Um, I think, can we talk a little bit more about defining those individuals that have direct contact? So for example, custodial or maintenance workers, um, you know, I, I think there's still some, you know, contention about the referee question. So can we just define maybe some roles that we might see direct contact and where we might not? Sure. Um, look, a very lawyerly answer, right? It's going to be very fact specific, right? It's going to de depend on what are our, you know, expectations or what is that employee's job duty? What do they entail, right? If they're going to have interaction on a, on a frequent basis with students, then yes, this is going to apply, right? But if it's a one-off where they don't see kids often or they're not in charge, of supervising those children or you know entrusted with the care of those children it's not going to apply i mean it's hard to to say every custodian this is going to apply to or every custodian is not going to apply to it it's going to depend are they the night custodian right do they do they ever see kids so but you know i think the the best approach is you really got to drill down on where we see interaction with kids Right. And, and we already kind of have a template for this or, or at least kind of a roadmap, right, for the direct daily contact with kids for the background check or the criminal background checks. So <laughs> I would love to give a definitive answer. These are the groups that it applies to. But I think it's more nuanced than that. I don't know if you guys want to add. Well, to yeah, sure. So even to run with the custodian example there, right? Let's say we're hiring a custodian to be a night custodian. And we we make the determination this individual is never going to have unsupervised contact with a student. Right. Right. There just isn't any interaction with students because their job is from, you yeah, know, sure. nine o'clock at night until five in the morning or, or whatever the hours are. What, what you do if you don't put that individual through this process on the front end when you hire them is you've now handcuffed your ability to transfer that night custodian to a day custodian position a year, three years, or five years down the line if you want to do that, whether it's involuntarily or upon request from the night custodian who says, I'm tired of working nights, I'd like to work days, and we say, yeah, you're a great employee, let's, let's do that. If we haven't put that individual through this process now in the middle of their employment, I think we would have to take the position that that's tantamount to applying for a new job. And because we've not done it with them before, then, we're yeah. going to have to do it now. So practically for positions like that, where there may be movement, I think it behooves us to, to just put the individual through this. And not to mention, even if we don't have to do it for that individual, there's nothing that prohibits us from doing okay. it for that individual. Correct. Right. Now, perhaps the applicant says, 
Now, the way I read the law or, you know, my attorney tells me I don't qualify because I'm not going to have regular contact with students. Therefore, I'm not filling out that form. I'm going to ask the question, well, why not? Right. Like we understand maybe legally it's not required, but what's what's your resistance to filling out that form? What's in your past that you don't want us to know? Right. So I would start getting, you know, raising an eyebrow and digging around on that. Um, referees or, or other positions like referees. I think if you look at the intent of the statute, right, and, and sometimes we get ourselves in trouble when we look at the intent instead of this plain language. But, you know, direct contact with students means the possibility of care, supervision, guidance, or control of children or students, or routine interaction with children or students. I don't think a, a referee, like, you know, a, a after school referee at a basketball game or a soccer game or what, what it, whatever it might be, cares, supervises, no, not really, controls students or children. I mean, they control them within the bounds of the sport or the game, but it's not control, I think, in what in the way the legislature intends control. I think the they culture interact culture. with students. They absolutely interact with students, but 100% of the time they interact with students in the presence of coaches, other adults, parents, I, I don't know that I would require referees to submit to this, but I also have a practical answer. We don't employ referees. My understanding, and, and if this isn't correct, let's have a conversation about it. Referees are employed by IESA or IHSA or whatever the, the governing body that we've, we've signed up to but referees aren't our employees. So to the extent this is required, it's required by their employing agencies and not by us. I agree with that, James. And I think that touches on a couple other questions that we have in the hopper here. Um, you know, what if it's, for example, I know a lot of our school districts or schools contract with nursing agencies. Um, you know, the school, even if the, the nurse is placed at the school, right? the employer ultimately is that contracting agency. So they're responsible for, for you know, providing this information. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I have a couple of just quick hits. How far back do we have to go? I think the answer is all the way back. As far as the individual, the applicants ever been employed. Does that include time when the applicant was employed as, as a minor? I think it could. If they were employed at 17 years old to be an assistant in a daycare center, that's going to cover and they, and they need to disclose that. Um, so the, the law doesn't limit how far back we go. Yeah. Um, what about, I, you know, there's a question here that I think is really interesting. Do we, do, do school employees or employers have a duty to disclose to DCFS um, information that they receive pursuant to these requests? I have, go ahead, Jay. I think you're going to speak, but I have thoughts on this as well. But I think as a mandatory reporter, right? So all school employees are mandatory reporters. If we acquire knowledge that somebody has abused a child, we have a duty to report that to DCFS. So if somebody is still within the ranks of employment, I mean, if, if, if we're taking a teacher, for example, if that teacher's license has not been revoked because of a licensure investigation based upon the prior misconduct, how that could have happened, you know, that that's not for us to really determine that prior employers should have made the reference. But if we're learning it, I think it behooves us to make the report to DCFS in case it's never been made before. Having said that, it's really going to de depend on the situation and the information that you get from that, that prior employer. And I mean, just somebody Somebody can be under investigation for, you know, boundary investigations, including, you know, putting a hand on a shoulder um, or, you know, calling somebody something sexually inappropriate that might not give rise to abuse as DCF, DCFS sees it under the, the Abuse and Neglected Child Reporting Act. I, so it's I, really going to depend on the facts. I would just add that for, so everyone is clear on this, that the law, and, and Emily touched on this in, during her part of this presentation, about when we receive information under this new law, we have the ability, it's expressly stated that we may report this to DCFS or the police or whomever. Given that authority, right, that we have the discretion to do this, I would err on the side of reporting. I think that, look, you're just going to be better covered 
if we have the authority to do it, I think you go ahead and do it if, if you have that reasonable belief that something may have occurred. Now, look, hopefully the past employer did it, but I wouldn't, exp I wouldn't leave yourself open with that exposure. And, and the past employer is supposed to be sharing records related to the investigation. So hopefully in the records is, right. is some indication as to whether DCFS was involved or not. If they've already been reported, I, you know, I think that probably excuses us. Yep, great um, point. Another question here, I've seen it come through in, in, in various iterations in the chat. What about last minute hires? And, and we know schools are constantly having to make last minute hires. Folks up and leave us last minute, things change. I think before the board can actually make that hire or before we actually put that person into our school buildings, we at least have to have received the, the form from the candidate and we at least have to have sent it out to the former employers. So there's going to have to be some fast moving before you put that person into the classroom. And I, and I know even though legally only the when it comes to public schools, at least only the board can hire um, individuals, you know, superintendents and principals don't have the authority to hire. We know that practically sometimes somebody's placed into the school buildings before the board meeting because the board meeting is not going to happen for three days. Right. That's not the best situation, but it may be what we're dealing with. At a minimum, for liability purposes, you have to have at least initiated that process to make the request from the other employers. Otherwise, there's potential risk. I know we're we're kind of coming up on our time here. I want to at least, I know there might be more questions. I want to just touch on one clarification point I'm seeing in the um, chat before we wrap up here. Um, so, so one of the questions that came up is clarifying when we're reporting these um, allegations of sexual misconduct, is it just those allegations that were between an employee and a student or do allegations between employees also apply? My it's only student sexual misconduct, at least under this law. Yes. Correct. That's the, that, and that comes from the law itself where it defines what sexual misconduct is, that it's with a student. Yep. Um, I know we have a lot of other questions. Um, if you want to, if you have further questions as you're starting to implement this process, um, please, you know, reach out to us um, and, and we're more than willing to kind of give you some support in this area as you're getting started. Um, anything else, James? And, well, I would just say, listen, if this is new to you, if you're just hearing about it for the first time today and we have 200 people on the call, it, it may be very new to some of you. Um, look into this. This is going to be a big burden on your offices until you get your systems kind of adjusted to just make this part of doing business. Um, it's, you know, I opened with this. It's going to be a challenge for our HR offices, uh, but the intent of the law is really important. And it's really designed to avoid those situations where we, we hire somebody, all the information was out there from prior school districts or prior employers. Um, this just gives us a formal mechanism of obtaining that information. Yep. Well said, well said. Right. Go, go enjoy the NCAA tournament. <laughs> thanks to all of you. All right, thanks Bye. guys. Bye. Bye.